fun, fun. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so what I want to do is, um, we have we should have a test on this on Monday. Monday, a week from today, uh, we should be able to cover what we need to do for this material. And then uh, after that, we should be able to start our one of our first projects. So I think that'll be different for you. We're working in, uh, go back in the lab a little bit, and then we'll come back and do another little unit. Then we'll do a, a very large lab after that. So we'll get, we are going to get in the lab here, just not too long from now. Well, first of all, we talked about this uh, thing for the measurement systems, and we talked about this one in particular, uh, metric system, and I thought there were things that they did that were just incredible. I, I, don't, I don't know how they thought about this stuff, actually. Uh, number one, they decided that all the measurements <clears throat> that they were going to have were going to be based <coughs> on this thing called the meter. And uh, so they had to have, um, once they had the meter, they knew they had powers of 10. They're going to base on powers of 10. They're going to use Latin and Greek prefixes. They weren't going to use French words or anything about a French king or anything like that. And they're going to base the meter itself on something that people wouldn't think was nationalistic. There's no nationalistic thing about the Earth. And so they said it was one ten millionth of the distance from the North Pole to the equator. Now, that was a great question you had about did they actually could they actually estimate what that was? Uh, at that. I don't know if I know the answer to that. Uh, I know that they they somehow, that's a good question. Um, did they use pure mathematics to figure out that this, that thing right here, that meter stick was, was that? Um, so then they, um, after they did the meter, we're gonna talk about this, uh, how they knew how far away around the earth. They knew that a long time ago. Once they made the meter, they said, well, now we're gonna do something for volume. And they took uh, a, a meter, long and a meter wide and a meter high if you made a box that big it just was impractical nobody would have ever used it so the next choice would be a tenth of a meter so they made the box one tenth of a meter by one tenth of a meter wide by one tenth of a meter so now uh, without memorizing these and i'm going to ask you to memorize this but there's a liter but you know that each side is a, a tenth of a meter a decimeter 10 centimeters you should be able to take all of those and cube them and find other ways of representing this cube. So this is one liter of volume. It's also known as one cubic decimeter of volume. It's also known as 1,000 cubic centimeters of volume or one million cubic millimeters. Does that make sense? Did we do, didn't we do this last week? I wanna make sure, that you have all these notes, right? I'm just kinda of going over them. So don't sit there and act like you have to memorize them. Just know your powers of 10 and know the box is one tenth of a meter, right? Or a decimeter. Now, the next thing they did was, um, and by the way, the Earth is, uh, if that's one ten millionth, there must be 40 million meters around the Earth. They're also known as 40,000 kilometers, which is really close to around 25,000 miles, if you like English system there. And let's go to the next one. They also uh, didn't stop there. They said, okay, let's, uh, let's do something for mass. We'll take this box, fill it with water, uh, later they found out that four degree water, um, four degree Celsius water is about the most dense liquid water ever gets. And so they said, if you fill in water, then we're gonna call that, they could have called it a gram, but if they were dealing with little things like gold, uh, what human likes to talk about 0. 0.001 grams? Nobody likes that. So they went ahead and made this a kilogram. And so that's a kilogram of mass. So if one liter of water as volume, equals one kilogram of mass, then a thousand milliliters of water is a thousand grams of mass, or on purpose, on purpose, they did this. Yes? Why is, why is, the, why is it that the most dense water can get is four degrees Celsius? Yeah, um, you'll find uh, every material, even though solids and liquids are essentially non-compressible, you can change your volume by a little bit uh, with temperature. You can't do that. Like engineers have to watch out for this all the time. You, you build a skyscraper in New York, it gets really hot, it gets really cold. Even they have to worry about uh, contracting and expanding things. Even when I uh, build a deck, uh, if I build a deck in the back of my house uh, and I put boards down, I never, you never put the boards right next to each other, especially if it's cool. Because in the summer they'll, they'll expand and they'll, it'll warp everything, okay? So um, we always have to worry about that. So they found out that every material 
every material, when you cool it, becomes a little less dense. So the volume, as the, uh, uh, as the temperature goes down, the volume goes down and, and it keeps going down for all materials. It just gets a little bit more, uh, a little bit more, less volume, a little less volume. But water is a weird thing because water does everything all the materials do until it gets to about four degrees Celsius. And then liquid water does this weird thing between four and zero. We'll talk about that in another chapter where it actually starts expanding. And that's weird. And yet it's one of the most, um, important materials on this planet and it has very very unique characteristics and we'll find out about that later but so water um, has to do with hydrogen bonding has to do with uh, how close they get together and they kind of push each other away but liquid water is still liquid at three degrees but it's actually it's actually less dense everything else is supposed to get more dense more dense when you cool it and so water kind of starts pushing itself around between four down to zero, and that's why even ice cubes are less dense than water. Uh, I don't know of any of the materials. Um, frozen gasoline will not will not float in gasoline. Frozen gold uh, will not will not float in liquid gold, but water does. <clears throat> so anyway, they decide to use this uh, as liquid water's most dense uh, temperature is about four degrees. That's about thirty nine. About 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Does that answer your question at all? Or? Well, <clears throat> Do I know why God made that? Uh, uh, I don't know that exactly, but. Yeah, kind of. Uh, we have another chapter where we'll talk about um, how the hydrogen bonding, um, the, the polar nature of water. I don't know if we talked about that in chemistry. I think we did. Remember the polar nature is plus and minus? When it gets so close, the plus and minus nature of water starts repelling and pushing the other ones away. <clears throat> and uh, but we'll get, we'll have that also <clears throat> in another chapter. So on purpose, on purpose, they made one milliliter of water equal to one gram. Everything was so simple. Also, what about density? Uh, we're going to do a big density unit later here. The density of water is one. They they made it one. It makes it everything so simple in the metric system. So I thought that was pretty neat. So what I like to do is <clears throat> I'm going to show you a. <clears throat> Ooh, let's see. Uh, <clears throat> uh, let's see which one it is, sir. No, not that one. No, 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 no. Uh, I think it was this one. I found it the other day. Did we start this the other day and you couldn't hear it? Okay, <clears throat> all right. Hello, this is our science teacher, Tim Martin. And in this video, we'll talk about Eratosthenes and how he measured the circumference of the earth 2,200 years ago. We'll also talk about how you can measure this today. Eratosthenes was an educated individual of Greek descent. At the time, like many other educated individuals, he spent some time in Alexandria, Egypt. While in Alexandria, Egypt, he read of a well a little further south in the country, located in the city of Sin. This well apparently was a very deep and straight well. He read that one time each year, presumably on the 21st of June, sunlight shone to the bottom of that well indicating that there were no shadows at that time. He also knew that although the sun was high in the sky in Alexandria, he was able to observe shadows, as you can see from this small flagpole. With this knowledge, Eratosthenes knew he had what was necessary to measure the circumference of planet Earth. Let's back up a little bit and talk about some of the other things that Eratosthenes knew. Eratosthenes knew basic geometry. Now, geometry is far more than measuring lines, and angles, and triangles, and other shapes. Take apart the word geo, earth, metry, measurement. Geometry is the science of measuring the earth, and Eratosthenes helped develop many of those principles. Eratosthenes knew the earth was round. 
300 years earlier, the mathematician Pythagoras helped establish the Earth was round by observing lunar eclipses. Eratosthenes knew that the sun's rays were parallel and that once a year, around the 21st of June, the sun shone to the bottom of the well in C. At the same time, he knew there were shadows in Alexandria, and he also knew the distance between Sin and Alexandria was approximately 5,000 stadia. That's plural for stadium, or the length of one stadium. That turns out to be approximately 925 kilometers. This measurement may be a little off because the method of measuring a great distance like this was timing how long it took traders with a camel train to make that trip. Let's take a little more look at his geometry. Eratosthenes knew that this well that was dug down in scene likely was straight enough that it would point directly at the center of the earth. Thus, those sun rays were pointing down towards the center of the earth over the well in Sea, Egypt. He also knew that if he put a flagpole vertically in the ground, it too would point towards the center of the Earth. He realized that if he measured the sun angle, that angle would be equal to the central angle inside the Earth, because he realized the flagpole created a transversal that crossed parallel lines. Through basic geometry, we know that the alternate interior angles, when a transversal cuts parallel lines, have equal measurements. From here, if we know the distance between Sine and Alexandria, that distance compared to the circumference of the Earth is proportional to the angular measurement to 360 degrees. Let's take a look at this a different way. I like to think about a pizza. Now imagine, if you have one piece of pizza left, let's take a protractor and measure the angular size of that pizza. Now let's take a tape measure and measure the length of the crust. Knowing the angular size of the pizza and the length of the crust, could you figure out how far it is the whole way around the pizza? Of course. Let's imagine that this piece of pizza is 45 degrees and has a crust of 10 centimeters. Let's see, 45 is half of 90. 90 is one fourth of the pizza. So that means I have one eighth of the pizza. If I have one eighth of the pizza and the crust is 10 centimeters, one eighth of the I can quickly calculate that the distance around the pizza must have been 80 centimeters. Or we can set this up mathematically. We can say the angle A, central angle, compared to 360 degrees, is proportionally equal to the arc length D, the length of the crust, compared to the circumference of the whole pizza. This is exactly what Eratosthenes did. Once he measured the sun angle at 7.2 degrees, he knew that was equal to the angle in the center of the Earth. Comparing 7.2 degrees to 360 degrees was proportionally equal to the distance between seen in Alexandria compared to the circumference of the whole planet. Eratosthenes did this calculation 2,200 years ago and calculated the circumference of the Earth to be 250,000 stadia. Remarkably close, considering this was two millennia ago. Each year, I wander around the autumnal equinox. My students repeat Eratosthenes' experiment. Rather than placing a pole in the ground and trying to get it perfectly perpendicular with the surface of the earth, we simply tie a weight onto a string. On the top of that string, we construct a flag out of tape. Then measure the length of this string from the tip of the weight to the top of the flag. As close as possible to solar noon on the equinox, that's 
that's approximately halfway between sunrise and sunset, we go out and measure the length of the shadow. Once we have these two measurements, we construct a one-tenth scale triangle using those measurements. Whether we use an electronic measuring and construction tool or make the construction with pencil and paper and measure with a protractor, we'll measure the upper angle of the triangle, which is the sun angle, equal to the angle between our location and the location where there is a zero degree sun angle. We find the distance to the equator, since that's where the sun is shining directly overhead. For those of us in the eastern United States, we can simply look up the distance from our location to Quito, Ecuador, a sizable city in Ecuador right on the equator. With the measurement of the sun angle and the distance to a location on the equator, we then go on to calculate the circumference and then the diameter of the Earth. I'd encourage you to give this a try. And as I tell my students, when you do this, I hope your answer is better than Eratosthenes. After all, we've had 2,200 years to improve on his work. Thanks for watching. So what do you think? Can you do this? Okay, let's talk. Let's talk about this a little bit. Uh, you ask about well, how did they base it on the Earth itself? How did they even know that the Earth was round? Well, they knew that a long time ago. They knew that it's kind of weird how certain people figured out that when I looked at the Moon on certain times, there was an eclipse. They called it a lunar eclipse. If you look at the Moon and the Moon's being eclipsed, they call that a lunar eclipse. You get that? So if you're looking at the Moon, it's a lunar eclipse. When it comes out. A solar eclipse looks like when the sun is looks like something's blocking the sun. That's a solar eclipse, right? So anyway, so let me uh, let me pause this. Let me go through the mathematics of this a little bit, and I want you to think about this. All right. First of all, uh, you had your hand up. I didn't answer it at the time. Do you remember what it was the question? No, I got it. <clears throat> First of all, he said some things. He said all the sun's rays are parallel. Do you agree with that? Like, really? That one going that way is parallel to that one going that way. But what did he say when he said they're parallel? What did he actually mean? Yes. Well, since the sun is the way it's bigger than the earth, two rays can come off the sun parallel to each other. Right. So they have right. They they go off in every direction, don't they? But if I gave two beams of light, let's say a uh, hundred beams of light, if I gave them a um, hundred miles and they weren't parallel, what would happen in a hundred miles? They would start going off from each other, wouldn't they? If they were slightly off, they would. So we're going to give them 93 million miles. 93 million miles. And if you're not parallel to me, okay, you went that way, right? But the ones that actually strike the Earth uh, are pretty parallel. Uh, the ones that actually make it to the Earth's surface, those are parallel. So then, uh, whether it's a well here or even a stick in the, I call it and he's that scene. Um, Right there, if it's a vertical stick or something goes straight down, it's pointing to the center of the earth. But what if I put a stick in the ground? What if I put a stick in the ground, it's vertical this way, it's vertical this way, then it's also pointing to the center of the earth. So I have these parallel lines right here. This is a sun rays right here. And then I'm pointing to the center of the earth, and so are you. So we have this thing called a transversal. So what is that? All you know about geometry? Um, Two parallel lines cut by a transversal create alternate interior angles. Remember that from geometry? So here's uh, Eratosthenes figuring it out, uh, and he's using a little ratio here. He says, okay, what angle is this? Okay, so the angle right here at the top of the stick was 7.2 degrees for him. So what does that mean? So what? So what it was 7.2 degrees? What does that mean? Well, it was, was that a whole circle? What fraction of a whole circle was that? It's uh, 7.2 360ths, isn't it? 
Now, I like the example he gave on this video. He said, what if I had a piece of pizza and it was a 45 degree angle? Well, Bobby, you even in your head can figure that out, can't you? 45 degree angle, that's half a 90. That's one eighth of the pie, isn't it? This isn't one eighth, but whatever fraction it is, he said, okay, whatever fraction it is in the world of, of degrees, it has to be the same ratio as in crust, like that. And I wrote down a number he had, it was 925. He said 925. Um, I actually read a little bit about Eratosthenes and the word stadia, or um, what they did is this camel train that would go to this outpost city, they, they knew about how, how far you go every day. Well, we, we, somehow they were to measure about how far they went every day and so how long to take you and then estimated the distance uh, down to this uh, Syene, the city. And that came out to be so many stadia, which today we call, we call it kilometers. And then X would be the whole circle. So whatever, whatever ratio it is in angles, it also has to be the same ratio in crust. Does that make sense to you? You guys are pretty high up in math. I bet, I bet you've already figured that out. Uh, can somebody put that in a calculator and tell me what you get? With his, since it was his video, I think he got 46,000. I thought it was less than that. But when, when I read uh, some more stuff about Eratosthenes, <clears throat> the stadia, he was either off by 0.5 degrees or 0.5 percent or about four percent he was either four percent off depending on what you use for your measure for stadium and i have to say that's pretty good to be um less than five percent off when <clears throat> number one uh that was a pretty crude measurement that stadia thing there and even the angle like that so what what would i what would i have you do uh, um how would I have you do this project? Well, let's say I wanted you to do this with a partner, okay? <clears throat> How would you set this up? And I'll tell you what, where it works really well. It works well right about this week. Sometime this week, uh, and even next week, I think it would work really well for you to do that. You could, you could set up some kind of a stick that you knew was vertical. You checked it, it was 90 degrees here, this way, it was 90 degrees this way. You could just stick, a, uh, put a stick in the ground and check for uh, how straight up and down it was, right? You could do that. Uh, he talked about just having somebody hang a weight down and maybe you have a weight that you can actually buy, you don't have to buy it, but they had these uh, weights in the, in the hardware store called plum bobs, you ever heard of that? You know what a plum bob is? A plum bob, P-L-U-M-B, get it? Lead, weight, plum bob, okay. So plum bob, you can actually buy these and they're actually pointed and you can hold a stick and Earth's gravity just simply makes it point down. You say, well, why would anybody use that? Well, people who build brick walls, how do they know they build them straight? How do they know they're building a brick wall? How do a bricklayer know that? And they put a string up there and hold a weight down. And they say, you're this far away from the string, so are you, so are you, so you see it? And that's how they, that's how they make brick walls straight with a plumb bob. So whether or not you use a plumb bob or whether you have a stick like this, Here's what we could do. You would have to have some way of measuring the sun's angle in Greensboro right up here. I see that? Now, we could do that. I, I think uh, to do this project, um, one way you could do it, I, I, I wouldn't mind if we did it both ways, is to find this angle, okay? That's one way of doing it. Um, what's another way we could do it? If, if, if I find the angle at the top of the stick, then I can plug it in to this thing here. So how else could I find that angle? Yes? Find the angle touching the ground. I could. I could find the angle touching the ground. There's another way. What's another way? Yes? Find the length of the sides. What is it? The length of the sides. Keep going. <laughs> so we could do trigonometry. Ah, okay. So we could do some trigonometry, couldn't we? So let's say that you knew this stick was uh, 100 centimeters. Let's say you use a meter stick or whatever you want to use, and then you could measure the shadow, could you? <clears throat> so you could measure the shadow. So which, uh, which trig function would you use to, to find that angle or this angle, which one, which one would you use now? Okay, so let's try it. So tangent, tangent is uh, opposite over adjacent, right? So as seen through the eyes of that angle, seen through that angle, I'm opposite, 
and you're adjacent, right? So here's a, here's a shadow here. Uh, I don't know what, I know what the number is. Um, I don't know what that, I'm gonna call it X. <clears throat> so we could use trigonometry and if you think you can get a pretty good measurement on that shadow and you have a pretty good measurement on the stick, then I, I can see doing it both ways. I can see where you take the angle here and put that in the equation, and then you find that angle using trigonometry and, and find the angle that way. So let's say uh, you're gonna calculate it both ways, all right? You, fi you find it one way with the protractor, you find it one way with the trigonometry. Now, oh, what else do you have to do? So let's say you find this angle, and by the way, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be close to 72. I'm gonna, I'll give you a hint. In Greensboro, it's not gonna be close to 72. You get that? Okay. Now, uh, what about this? What else do we need? If you're gonna do this in Greensboro, you need the angle, you need one more thing. What else do you need? Yes. Right, so what I'd like you to do is you have to look up someplace that, and I'll teach you a little bit of a geog geography here a little bit. Um, what are the lines on, a, um, on the globe, the lines that go this way? They, they go, and they, if you look at this globe here, here's the biggest one of those lines, it's called the equator. The equator is called zero degrees, what do you call it, starts at L? Latitude. Latitude. And then you go up here and you get uh, 30 and 60 degrees latitude and notice the circles get smaller, don't they? The circles get smaller. And so you go, you go north, you can go north latitudes, 30, 60, 90, 90 north is the North Pole. And you can also go so south, 30, 60, 90 degrees south latitude, see that? Now we don't want that, but we want these other lines. What are these other lines that we decide to divide the earth into what are they called? They're not latitude lines, what are they? Somebody said. Longitude. longitude, aren't they? And our meridians. So longitude lines, what's interesting about them, they're all the same size, aren't they? So what we need is, we need somewhere, here's Greensboro right here, and we've had to look up there, the, the uh, longitude line for Greensboro. And then we gotta find somewhere on the equator that has the same longitude line. See so that? With a little bit of research, you can do that. So you find um, some place that is due south, due south of Greensboro on the equator. So I know you can do that. So anyway, uh, then I should be able to calculate two different ways. One, using some kind of a protractor, and two, using trigonometry. Yes? What if you live in California and your point is in the middle of the ocean? Uh, that, that would be harder. That'd be hard for me. And it just so happens, I've done this before, and I happen to know, um, let me find it. It's gonna be in Ecuador. So it, it looks like it's gonna be in Ecuador somewhere, okay? So we're lucky, we almost missed. We almost missed uh, South America. So what I think would be interesting to do is to, um, to do this and see what we get. Now, I wanna to try to tell you why it works in the next couple of weeks better than other times. It's not that I can't do it other times, but it works really well um, at, uh, during this next couple of weeks, all right? And if I, I don't even, I can even tell you the answer. Uh, I just honestly, just do this honestly, okay? I want you to do it honestly. But what I wanna show you is something that um, a lot of people, um, have I ever told you about a globe ever? I think I have, right? I didn't come into play chemistry. I don't see how it would. But see this globe? This is an older globe. And I think what I like it, all the globes when I was younger, they all had these on there. And now today's globes, you don't even see these on there. I think they're afraid of making somebody, oh, offending somebody because I put it right on top of your island. Okay, you know, that's gonna happen. If you want to put something on a globe, you know, how about this, huh? Huh? Okay, see how little well, anyway, uh, nowadays you don't even see this. Do you even know what this is called? What is it? Very resourceful, look at that. Your eyes. You're looking right at it, aren't you? Very good. This is called an analemma. Ana means annual, yearly, okay? Analemma, it looks kind of like a figure eight, doesn't it? See that? 
And what's interesting is everybody's birthday is on there. Everybody's birthday is on the analoma. And so, for example, I'm looking up here, and it says uh, around June 21st, right there. See? That's interesting. And down here, uh, December 21st. Well, that's pretty interesting. And, and what about right here? Uh, what about when it crosses the equator, right, right here? Uh, uh, September about 21st and somewhere around March 21st. Hmm. Hmm. What do you think about that? Okay, so what the analemma tells you is um, at what, what date is the sun directly overhead at noon? Oh, I didn't finish my story. I'm sorry. If you're going to do this project over here, when do you take that angle? You get up at 8 o'clock in the morning and your stick's ready and you, you take, is that when you take it? No, because the shadow will be very long in the morning as the sun comes up. What happens to the shadow? It starts moving and getting shorter. shorter. And then it'll start doing what? Getting longer. Longer and going that way. So what we want is we really want the time when the shadow is the shortest, the shortest shadow. Now they call that solar noon. Solar noon, not necessarily on your watch. We have daylight savings time, all kinds of stuff, don't we? So solar noon would be the time when the sun is, uh, gives the smallest shadow on a stick, like that. All right, so here's the analytics. Let's go back to the analytics. Ready? Uh, when is the sun's rays uh, the most direct, or I mean directly overhead, um, on January the 21st. It's up here. Now, what do you mean up here? Well, up here, I'm on a dotted line. I'm right on a dotted line here on the globe. Does anybody know what that dotted line is called? Did you guys ever had this in elementary? Did they ever talk about the equator? Did they ever talk about the Tropic of Cancer? Have you ever heard this? I'm looking at your faces. <laughs> it's Monday morning, right? All right, so when you look at a globe, so what's a globe? Okay, when you look at a map or a globe, you're gonna see the equator, see that? That's called zero degrees latitude. All right, got that? Now, this analemma says the sun will be directly overhead on uh, June 21st if you're anywhere at 23 and a half degrees north latitude. 23 and a half degrees north latitude, there's a dotted line called the Tropic of Cancer. Get that? Now, if you go down here, the sun's most direct rays are down here at 23 and a half degrees south latitude in December 21st. Now, I need your attention on here because this, this is pretty neat. Uh, what about these two things? If you're in uh, North Carolina, what kind of weather are you having? What's it all about here, June 21st? And what about December 21st? So if I were looking in, in the summertime in Greensboro, if it was June 21st, then the sun would be pretty high in the sky. It would never be directly over my head. How do I know that? Because if you don't live within 23 and a half degrees north and 23 and a half degrees south, if you don't live in that band, the sun will never be directly over your head, ever, ever. And guess what they call that band between here and here? First of the T. The word they use all the time when they talk about storms. Okay, if they originate in the band, they're called tropical storms. That's the tropics. So you don't live in the tropics. You don't live in the tropics because you have to live between here and here to live in the tropics. Because you don't have any day in a year. No, never is the sun directed overhead in Greensboro. Because you live up here. You live right here. So if you wanted to pick your birthday, you said, uh, you know what, I always wanted to go somewhere where the sun would be directly overhead on my birthday. Find your birthday, find a latitude, and find some country you want to go to. See that? And then go there and be ready at noon. And then you'll see it. And you'll stand there in your shadow. You won't have a shadow except right underneath your feet. You put a stick in the ground, it won't be any shadow on the stick. You say, oh, I always wanted to do that. So that's what the analemma is talking about here. Now, the dates I'm looking at, uh, the first, uh, by the way, the, does everybody know what they're called? Uh, the first day of summer, first day of winter, what's that called? Uh, the other one. Solstice. Solstice, okay. 
So you have a summer solstice and a winter solstice, and they call it for us. They call it the, uh, June 24th. They call that the longest day of the year. We know that's not true. It's not the longest day. It's the longest amount of daylight hours. Of the 24, you'll see the sun the longest on that day. You see that? That's what makes it the longest day. It's the same amount of day. See that? And what about our, what about what we call this one? December 21st. That's the shortest day of the year. It says it's the least amount of sunlight you'll ever see all year. And let's go to the other one now. What about these other two dates? The March and the September. What's that called? Go ahead. Okay. And the one in the fall is called the fall equinox or autumnal equinox. And the one in the spring is called the vernal equinox or spring equinox. Equal night. Equinox. Everybody on the planet, everybody on the planet on this day, all right, will have exactly 12 hours of sunlight and exactly 12 hours at night. See that? So if we do it on the equinox, if we do it on the equinox, we can do this experiment really easily. And I'll even tell you the answer, okay? I'll even tell you the answer so that you can do a percent error. We're going to do percent error this week. You can do a percent error calculation this week on your on your project so uh if you were to look up um uh, what's interesting if you looked up greenboro's latitude right 10 20 30 they might happen to know they might hear happen to know anywhere close what's greensboro's latitude anybody know 45 yeah. degrees 30. You're, you're getting there it's less than 45 more than 30. 35. Ah, that's really close 36. It is about 36. So anyway, uh, Greensboro is around 36 degrees north latitude. And again, I don't want you, if you do this project uh, right, I don't want you to, to say it's 36. I, I'd rather you not know it at all. But I'd rather see what you get and then see what your percent is, right? But if we do that, what's interesting is on the equinox, if the sun's most direct rays are at the equator, then we'll find your latitude. You can actually find your latitude on that day and again you can do it anytime in the next couple weeks so i'll probably give you like until the end of next week or something like this i'll even let you do it with a partner i'll let you do that or if you don't want to you can do it by yourself yes is this in class or outside this class? would be outside class i i could do it um but you wouldn't be ready to do a stick tomorrow would you, what do you mean? see is it going to be sunny like two days from now or i can do it on friday except we don't have class on friday but you would you really? <laughs> you might not want to do that on Friday, would you? See, I think I think you have to do it on a weekend, or you have to do it sometime when you, um, if you wanted, if you and your partner wanted to stick that stick in the ground tomorrow, the next day, or next day, or next day, or next day, or next, day, or next ten days uh, at school, you could do that. That's all you need. You just need it in there long enough to uh, get a reading, don't you? And it has to be in there long enough that you know when the shortest shadow is, too, right? So anyway, um, I want to show you just a little bit about this. And so the reason that Greensboro will never have the sun directly overhead because we're outside of the, of the tropics, aren't we? So I don't know if this helps you or not, but the next time you see those little dates on the calendar, think of it, it's not really just a date. It's a real astronomical event. Uh, I have some good news and bad news for you. Um, December 21st, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, whoa. June the 21st, was the longest day of the year, but guess what happens right after that? The um, sunlight hours slowly get shorter and shorter and shorter, and they go all the way to 12. They go down to 12 hours, and tomorrow, the first day of fall, got some bad news for you. Guess what's going to happen again? What's going to keep happening? The amount of daylight hours are getting smaller and smaller and smaller until they get to December the 21st. December 21st will be the smallest amount of daylight hours we have. And then the good news, after December 21st, it'll be slow. You'll slowly get more hours of sunlight, more hours of sunlight. See that? So we're actually uh, getting uh, less and less sunlight every day. Now, there's other things. I'm not here to teach you astronomy. That'd be a neat class to have. But there's other things to think about is that when the sun is di most directly overhead, in June 21st, we get more direct sun rays 
for a longer period of time. That's why we tend to experience summer. We have summer because we get the longest amount of hours and the sun's more direct in the northern hemisphere. That's our summer. And I had this, I gave, I gave this for extra credit many years ago. I might still do it. If you could find someone or even write a letter or an email to some kind of a travel bureau in South America, uh, South Pol Southern Hemisphere, I'm sorry, and ask them for a calendar that has pictures on it. And what would we see in June 21st? On June, the calendar, you see people going to the beach, stuff like that. What are you gonna see in like South America or Australia? They're gonna be bundled up because the first day of summer for us is the first day of winter for the Southern Hemisphere. Oh, I don't think so. Think about that? Really has winter though. Now, it's true that Australia, because it's surrounded by water, it's not going to have as many of the extreme uh, conditions that we do. Um, what about the first day of fall tomorrow? What would, what's happening in, in uh, South America or even Australia? What's that called for them? First day of spring. It is. Do you see how that works? Okay, so if you've never been taught that, I think that was, that's worth it. So here's what I'd like to, to challenge you, all right? Um, if you would like to do this by yourself, you can. But if you want to have a partner, you can do that also. Well, let's talk about this. Let's say by the end of next week. How about that? Did that give you enough time? By the end of next week, what I'd like you to do is to try to figure out what day you're going to be able to either stick a stick in the ground or you could even, I don't know if you want to use a videotape. I wonder how you could do it using technology, but you want to put a stick in the ground and make sure you have looked at the shadows and figure out when solar noon is. Everybody get that? Solar noon. And what you really need is you need the height of the stick or if it's a plumb bob, you need that right there. You need that length right there. And also, I want you to try to get the angle up here with a protractor, like that. So, anyway, with a protractor, figure out, uh, and also you got to look up one more thing. You got to look up uh, someplace in uh, Ecuador that has the same longitude line as Greensboro, and then find that distance right there. Now, what you do is you turn in your calculations and then do a percent error. Now, to do percent error, you have to know what the target is, right? So, you can look that up. You can look up Greensboro's. Um, latitude and see how, how close you got. So if, you, if your calculation said 45 degrees and you found out that Greensboro is 36 point something, then you could do your percent error like that. All right, so I want to give you uh, till next Thursday, you have till next Thursday for you to do it by yourself or a partner and you need to do it somewhere solar noon. If you want to bring your stuff to school and set it up out there and just say at lunchtime, you could go check it you go check it and say shorter shadow, shorter shadow. Uh, that's all you need. So you can do it at school if you want, or you could do it uh, over the weekend. Are you going to assign partners? Uh, no, I, I hadn't planned on assigning partners, but because um, some people are going to do it by themselves, so I didn't know about that. Um, what? Um, let's see. What if I gave you two weekends? Would that be? Would that give you enough? So what if I said two weeks from today? What about that? Now, if you do it too far away from the equinox, that's going to make you have more error. Everybody get that? So I'd rather you, I'd rather if you did it within the within two weeks of the equinox, uh, I think you're going to get pretty good numbers. So uh, I'll go over this again tomorrow. You pick a partner or do it by yourself and say, what I really need to do is figure out that. Am I going to stick a stick in the ground or am I going to use a plumb bob? And am I gonna, how am I going to measure? If I have a string like here, if I have a shadow here, I gotta put a little card up here or something. I gotta. How do I measure the angle? How can I measure the angle? Yes. What format are we turning our stuff in? I would say you're trying to find the circumference of the Earth without leaving Greensboro. That's that might be your title. And then you'd say step one. Here's what we did, and made a little sketch of what your drawing was. Here's my calculations using the protractor angle. Here's my calculation using the trigonometry, and and then do your percent error. So it probably a fit in one page. Unless you want to get fancy and draw some drawings and stuff like that. Yes? How much is this going to be worth? Uh, I thought it would be at least 30 points. 30 points uh, for you and your partner to do this. 
it's really not as much work as you think. Uh, the main thing is figuring out how to do the stick. That's going to be more work than anything else like that. All right. Well, let's think about that. And um, you could even research right now or today or sometime. You could research and figure out the other number you need. And then the main thing is to figure out how to put that stick in the ground. All right. Tomorrow...